Well, I hope today I can share some experiences and some uh, stories that will open up your mind and make you excited, maybe uh, cause you to pursue your dreams, or at least to pursue doing really good work in your life and meaningful work. I'm not a teacher. You know, I'm not as good a communicator as your typical professor, or certainly Professor McKay, whom, as she said, I've known since uh, high school when I had long hair and uh, was working at Sears and trying to meet, you know, my car payment, like many of you are doing. Uh, I lived in Moody Towers. Uh, I worked at Sears on Main. I took anywhere from 12 to 18 units, and I worked anywhere from 28 to 40 hours a week. And uh, didn't have much of a social life, but it was all worth it. And I met someone, fell in love, and uh, moved to California. And that's the only reason I didn't finish here. Um, I spent two years here, and, and much of what I learned at the University of Houston is what I use every day. What I learned at UCLA, I don't use every day, but it was a good education. It was a degree in economics. It was very theoretical, a lot of calculus, a lot of economic modeling. Here I took a lot of computer work. We actually punched computer cards back then. Um, learned a lot in business finance, which is very helpful, business math. And uh, when I graduated, uh, I graduated into a recession. Uh, Reagan had just been elected. Uh, interest rates on home loans were 21%. Not 4%, but 21% for a home loan. Nobody was hiring. Uh, I interviewed a lot for banks. I didn't want a bank job. Uh, I just did it for practice. I ended up lucking out and getting into a job at AT&T, Pacific Telephone at the time, and I did it. They spent about two minutes on my degree, and they spent hours on my work experience because when I was at Sears, I took advantage of everything they had. I took all their training classes. I became a department manager. Uh, you know, I, had, I was 19. I had 40-year-old people working for me. So I think that, you know, your experience here working Going to school is very, very important. What I've done is I've put together some slides on what I think entrepreneurship is, and then at the end I have a list of some of the stuff that I've done, everything from helping to start Razor scooters in the 90s to starting several computer startups and websites. So hopefully you can see some of these slides. They, they are kind of washed out, but today, Job creation is at the top of everybody's tongue, right? Can't help Democrats, Republicans, Tea Party, whoever's talking about it, job creation. And who creates jobs? Generally speaking, not big companies unless they're going through a demographic age shift where everybody's retiring. And that's how I joined the phone company. Everybody was retiring. People were retiring with 40 years of service, and I lucked out in a recession, and I got into their training program. That's very unusual. So everyone's talking about entrepreneurship. And so entrepreneurs play a, a vital role in the global economy. Increase economic activity, drive innovation, create jobs. And you know, there's many romantic uh, visions that create an appealing storyline. There's Apple, obviously, with the death of Steve Jobs. Everybody's talking about Apple. Everybody's talking about his vision, his creation. Facebook, how many of you saw The Social Network, the movie? Yeah, that was a cool movie. That guy's created a lot of jobs, and uh, it's a very cool story. Uh, Google, certainly. You know, I think they have their own wide-body 747 that's pimped out into an apartment building that they fly around in. That's a great story. I was a part of a much smaller one, and it was a lot of fun. We did Razor scooters in California. I was living in Laguna Hills. I was introduced through an advertising agency to the founder. He was a lawyer who was into toys. He'd been in the toy business off and on, in addition to running a legal practice, and I was a part of Razor Scooters that took off like crazy and uh, made a lot of money there. Um, entrepreneurs are vital to society, for, for what we all know, creating jobs, paying taxes. Uh, a lot of people want to decode what it takes. There's people in China, there's people in Russia, there's people here trying to figure out what it takes to create businesses, good, good businesses, and businesses that are, are uh, adding jobs. 
Uh, so people are looking for a formula or a model. What is it? What can we do? People start incubators. Venture capital firms have incubation outfits that they go out and they get the, bit, the best and the brightest. They put them in a room and they try and figure out what's going to be the next greatest thing. Is it a gene? Did Steve, was Steve Jobs born with this gene that causes him to think differently than everybody else? Or was it the LSD that he took on his trip to India? You know, I, I, I don't know. Is it the conditions? Could be. I mean, there's an awful lot of startup you know, technology alleys. There's one in New England around Boston. There's certainly the Silicon Valley. And you know, different parts of the country have different concentrations of different industries where people get together. So I think conditions are important. I saw this on Google, so I don't know if it's true or not. Over 100 universities teach entrepreneurship. You know, governments want it and need it, whether, they're, whether they have a true capitalist society or not, they still want businesses to open. And big companies, you know, I've worked for one of the biggest companies. When I graduated, I worked for, as I said, AT&T. We're the largest company in the world at the time before we were broken up. Uh, it's not the current AT&T, which was Southwestern Bell. That's a whole other story. But the Ma Bell, the original Ma Bell, which had a monopoly right on the telephone business. But they're looking for companies within companies. They're looking for people like yourself who are working for them to ignite a spark, to come up with that new idea. Someone young like you who has a better way to do something, a more efficient way to deliver a product, a better product, a different product, a product that's going to make their product obsolete. And one of my first startups, actually the first startups that I did, was internally at the phone company on the West Coast. And I got funded, and I didn't know it at the time. I didn't think it was much money. I went through several meetings, went to the vice chairman of the board, pitched and pitched and pitched and pitched and pitched and pitched and pitched, and pitched, and pitched. had a sponsor who was a VP level, and I got a $17 million line of credit to start a company within a company. And I wish I had that $17 million line of credit today, but I, the entrepreneur, if you will, inside of a corporation, some companies give it lip service, but some companies really really do want that to happen because they know if they don't, somebody from an outside company is going to obsolete their product. So they'd rather obsolete their own product internally, and that's a heck of a way to, for you internally to make certainly not entrepreneurial Facebook kind of money or Google kind of money, but it's certainly a way to be known and to rise in a corporation and to make bonus money. Uh, I was the youngest uh, director and executive director level within the phone company based on starting two companies within, within the phone company. Um, so vital to society. So who are entrepreneurs? Um, you know, there's a lot of concepts around the Michael Dell model where, and the Bill Gates model where you never finish college. You have a bright idea and you know you're 19 or 20 years old and you go for it. And you know someone who knows someone who knows someone who can write a check, and they can write a check, and your dad can write a check. And before you know it, you know, you've got the Porsche, and you've got the house and the party house. But in reality, if you look at the stats, most entrepreneurs have worked somewhere. They are young. Most, more than half have started their company before age 30. And you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. I think one of the key reasons, in my experience, is you need a lot of energy and you need to be able to commit yourself to a heck of a lot of hours. I mean, you're talking serious, serious commitment to the business and grinding it out with a small group of people who you better get along with. So under the age of 30 is the ideal time to do that. But, but typically, the Michael Dell model or the Bill Gates model where you're quitting school is not true. Um, a vital foundation increases your chance of success, and a higher education is important. One of the areas that I was weak on was finance and financial modeling. And I continue to study it to this day. And I surround myself with a good controller and a good CFO. You really got to know your cash flow. You got to know your financial statements. So if you're thinking about taking some extra credit or some, some additional courses in finance, I would encourage you to. If you're strong in that area or you're an engineer, then certainly you want to kind of surround yourself with the sales and marketing oriented people. <clears throat> um, 
So the traditional entrepreneur has experience. They have maybe one or two corporate jobs where they've learned and trained. They have a higher education. They've got their degree. Um, you hear something often bantied about, maybe even on a resume, that someone's a serial entrepreneur. Um, what that should mean is that starting a business and being successful and going forward is rarely you know, a one-off deal. Rarely do you, you're, are you successful right out of the gate with one idea. That idea changes, your business plan changes. You know, it's kind of like a battle plan when you're a general, when you're in the war, you better have a plan, right? But that plan's always changing when reality meets the road. When your customers don't buy as much as you think they're gonna buy, they don't pay the price you think they're gonna pay, and your suppliers aren't doing what you think they're gonna be doing. Um, so most entrepreneurs have launched at least two companies. It allows you to gain uh, valuable insights. It, it, it allows you to fail. And I think that uh, that's very, very important. And one of the things that I found in addition to understanding cash flow and finance and, and those areas of being an entrepreneur is forming networks and of employees and partners and friends. Uh, when you're going to school, you know, you meet a lot of people, you may not stay in touch with them. Of course, today with social networking, it's much easier. Whether it's a professional social network like LinkedIn, or whether it's a social social network like Facebook, which is trying to become more professional. Uh, in my day and age, we didn't have that. And um, you know, you, you had friends and you made friends and you dropped them. I think the key is, you know, never step on anybody's toe. Never anger a friend or an enemy. And don't make enemies. You just never know. Life is a long, long road. You need to build networks of people that can support you, get excited about what you're doing, uh, and lead you to the right source of money uh, or fellow employees. Um, what are the biggest barriers, just like anything else, whether it's buying a house, buying a car, or paying your tuition? The number one and most common barrier is funding. Most startups, however, the best way, of course, is to bootstrap, to get your product into the market and try it and build and build from there. Um, it's even more difficult today. Uh, banks aren't lo uh, loaning money, and it's more difficult to uh, get venture money if you're thinking about going the venture capital route, like you've seen in the movies, or you maybe know uh, friends or acquaintances that have gotten venture capital. So the other big barrier is people. Who do you bring in as your partners? Who do you bring in as your employees? Because as an entrepreneur, no matter how young you are, how young your business is, you're gonna have employees and you wanna bring in the right people. And I think the number one thing is they should share your culture, what you want to build. You know, if you wanna build a fashion house with a certain look and feel, you want people who who see that vision, who understand that vision, who have that passion. Um, in fact, when you're interviewing people, I think it's more important, not their background, whether they're successful in a small company or a big company, or they have an impressive resume, but if they bought into your vision, you see that they, they already have the same vision or similar vision, or they buy into it, I think that's extremely important because they're, they're gonna need to have the enthusiasm to work with you and not be fighting you all the way with their ideas that may be different or counterproductive, or they have uh, a, another whole agenda for working for you. Um, that's extremely important. And they bring know-how and expertise. One of the things that you should think about doing if you have a business idea is advisors. Having somebody to advise you who has done what you want to do who can refer you to people who have also money, uh, people who, who know who a good supplier might be, who know all the mistakes that can be made. I think that's important. You can go a heck of a lot faster if you don't keep making mistakes that other people have made. So don't be an island to yourself. Don't think that, you know, I, I'm smart, I know what I'm doing, everybody else is wrong. A lot of people could be wrong and it's okay to have a vision, it's okay to feel that you're right 
because you might be you might be the next Steve Jobs, or you might be the next Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg. But if too many people are saying things that don't agree with your idea, you have to listen and you have to be willing to kind of change your model. Um, so a lot of books talk about you must build um, an ecosystem, you know, networks of resources to address these areas. So any questions so far? Is this stuff that you're getting into in the class? Am I recovering stuff you already know or it's good? Okay. So one thing that is true when we're trying to decode what it takes to be successful, you know, you don't need to wear sneakers, Levi jeans and a black t-shirt and wear a beard to be successful. You know, you don't need to look like an entrepreneur. You can be an individual. You can be yourself. You are you. Don't try and change who you are. Don't try and model yourself after somebody. That's what people in corporations do. You know, years ago, I was calling on Montgomery Ward, which is like a Sears. They don't exist anymore. Um, and they had a new CEO come in. And the CEO wore a, a blue-bodied shirt with a white collar and a tie, and he wore French cuff shirts every day. And I would fly in once a month to call on these guys in major corporate meetings. And within two months, everybody in the building was wearing the same outfit. So that, that's not what it takes to be successful as an entrepreneur. What, what everyone talks about is a strong internal locus of control. In other words, a belief that you control your destiny. You're not the type of person who says, this didn't happen because my professor didn't give me this, or the engineering department didn't deliver this on time, or the packaging sucked. The marketing campaign was under budget. If I only had two more salespeople, that is a death knell. Because even in a large corporation, there are never, ever enough resources. You know, everybody looks in everybody's backyard and it looks greener, right? The entrepreneur who has very little money is always looking at the well-funded corporate business, but well-funded corporate business doesn't get all the funds either. So, Entrepreneurs are individuals, but they all either have or need to develop a sense of, I'm in control, I'm responsible for what happens. It's a strong internal locus of control. Um, seize opportunities where others seize disruption. So you're going along and you have, a smart, you have a regular cell phone company like Nokia, and you don't change, and then along comes Apple. Who would have thought that at least 20 years ago that Apple would come to dominate the smartphone business. So entrepreneurs see opportunities where there's disruption or they create disruption. It can be very simple disruption in a very simple business or it can be a major technology. We like to read about the major technologies. Those are fun. But if you're delivering your product differently, think about it. Um, there's many, many companies that have gone retail direct that, are, that were just simply manufacturers. So they, cha they disrupted the business model. So Apple has stores, Sony has stores. You'll see that happen more and more. Websites, the internet has created major disruption. So your ability to not see the downside to things, but to see upsides. When you find yourself seeing the downside, Look at the upside. Where's the business opportunity? For every downside, for every recession, for every plant closing, for everything that's happening down, there is a reverse upside. And that's how people make money. Um, when I was at the phone company, we made money on landlines. Nobody has a landline hardly anymore. It cost us a buck forty a month to provide the landline, and we charged about $15 a month, and we made a buttload of money. Those days are gone. Uh, accepting calculated risk. Calculated risk to me means understanding the numbers and looking at the numbers and how much you have to lose and how much you have to gain. It's not going to Vegas playing poker, although I'm sure you all have heard the FedEx story. When he was failing, the founder of FedEx was failing, he had about a quarter of a million dollar payroll. He got on one of his FedEx jets and flew to Vegas and he won the payroll. So. Uh, Fred Smith, if you Google that, you can read it tonight. Fred Smith, Vegas, payroll. You'll be able to hear that story. That's not your typical way to take a calculated risk, but it happens. 
Um, you also have to have a tolerance uh, for failure. Um, and you may have some early success followed by failure. You know, it's not always in a textbook order, if you will. Um, Apple has been successful. They have been $4 a share, and they have been extremely successful at $300 a share. So it just depends on the time frame and the people who are in the business. So what are the additional traits that drive success? Passion. I think you have to have a passion. If you're looking at going into a startup with a friend, or you're the actual idea person, and you don't have a passion for it, you're entering a danger zone for a lot of reasons. It takes a lot of work. You could lose all your savings. There's legal risks sometimes. So you have to have a passion for what you're doing. Persistence. You know what persistence is. You're here. You're going to school. Some people are not going to school. They're taking the easy way out. You're here for your 5% credit. I know you're not here to necessarily listen to me. But uh, persistence is extremely important. Um, you know, ability to work with a team yet follow your own instincts. I think this is probably one of, the, one of the hardest things to do and to learn to do. Some people are, I will admit, a natural at it. If you, if you read about some entrepreneurs, they've been horrible at it. Steve Jobs would work three to four days in a row. No sleep. Now, I can work 12, 15, 16, 18 hours. I've done it. Done it repeatedly. Done it for years on end. But I don't think I can work four days in a row without sleep. And Steve Jobs has no compassion for, had no compassion for a lot of people. So he's not the best example. But it is a key skill of being able to follow your own ideas, your own strategies, but be able to work with people. You can't be the CFO. You can't be the legal department. You can't be the engineer. You have to pick what you're good at and then surround yourself with good people. And if they happen to be people, be people that you are friends with, that's even better. In fact, that's what I recommend, because you're going to be living with people for a long time. Make sure you like them. That should be a part of your sort of vetting process. You should be constantly finding people that you like in your life, maybe not for your first venture, maybe not for your second venture, maybe not for your third venture, but you should be collecting people that you find really smart, really cool, and you should stay in touch with them because 10 years from now, they may be the perfect fit for what you're trying to do. And that's what I've done in my life. I've, I've coll I collect people, and I try and stay in touch with people. Um, what I find is women are good at it. <laughs> Guys, guy on guy in touch typically is they need something. And that's bad. I mean, even if you send somebody an email twice a year, how you doing, what's going on, how's your health, that's all it takes. I get emails from people that I haven't seen in 10 years Typically when I change into something new that might excite them and they want to be a part of it, I haven't heard from them. I don't know what they're doing. I don't even know if they're in jail. I have no idea. <laughs> so collect people. Find somebody you like here. Make sure that you're in touch with them in 2020. That's going to be extremely important. They might turn out to be a rich lawyer. They might turn out to be a brilliant engineer. You know, you just never know. Or you just maybe like doing stuff with them. And that's important. It helps you create a culture of success. Um, that's just so important. In terms of what you should be looking out for your opportunities, did Microsoft start as a big company that was in every PC that shipped? They did not. They started out in a niche. So if you can identify a niche that you can get into, get into that niche on low funding and be the best at it, and then expand into other niches, that's how you build a business. That's how Apple built their business. That's how Microsoft built their business. That's how restaurants build their business. That's how restaurants become restaurant holding companies. That's how restaurant holding companies get sold to hedge funds. And that's how hedge funds pay the owner a you know, billion dollars for something that started as a Mexican restaurant location based on grandma's cooking. That's how that happens. Um, and focus on building, like I said, the ecosystems to support the venture. 
So even if you're not going into entrepreneurship or starting your own business, these are things that I really still feel that are extremely important to anybody in business. So if you're gonna go work for somebody, you're gonna go get a job with Exxon, you're gonna go get a job with uh, Southwestern Bell or whomever, vision, resilience, teamwork, innovation, texting your friend in the entrepreneurship class is not on there, uh, innovation, passion, leadership, integrity, quality, customer focus, Customer focus, customer focus, customer focus, customer focus, and flexibility. You have to be flexible. So, as I said, there's too many challenges to handle on your own. Build your ecosystem, know who you are not who you want to be. It's okay to, to, to shoot towards and mold and change yourself, especially when you're under 30, when you're under 40. You can change yourself, you can mold yourself, you can build to that, but know what you like to do. One of the things I always ask in a job interview, if you have one day a week to do what you want to do, working for me, what would you do? So if I'm hiring in the marketing and sales area and I ask someone, what do you want to do on a Friday if you had, it, if you had total control over your schedule? And that's how I really know what the person likes to do. And some people know it's a setup. A lot of people don't. They just get off and they tell me what they want to do. A lot of people want to make cold calls. A lot of people want to sell. Some people want to create ads. Some people want to build a website. I came up through the sales and marketing ranks. I find a lot of people who want to sell on a Friday. That's what they want to do. They don't want to do admin work. They don't want to do paperwork. That's when I know that's their passion. If I find another passion, that's it, I really know the person through that question. Know who you are. Know what you want to do on a Friday. Other than entertainment, of course, I'm talking about work and career. What would you like to do if you could do it eight, nine, 10 hours a day? I think that's important. Location can be crucial. There's a reason there's a Silicon Valley. There's a reason that Texas is the oil capital and Houston is the pipeline and oil capital. There's a reason why certain kinds of startups start in New York there's a reason why Mark Zuckerberg moved to Silicon Valley. Location can be important to what you want to do. And if what you want to do isn't well supported with an infrastructure, you might want to consider moving. Moving to California, moving, where, moving to wherever you, you feel there's a better chance for your business. It can be scary and it can be fun and you can also reinvent yourself. No one knows really who you are moving, you reinvent yourself, and you can create the new you, who you, you know who you are, not defined maybe by your hometown. I went to high school in a small town, Lampasas. I was Hobart, that was my first name, Hobart. Hey, Hobart, the professor. So I remade myself. I had the glasses and the long hair. And I remade myself. You can remake yourself when you move, and I think the reason to move is if the location is crucial. Or like me, you fall in love with somebody and they move. <laughs> so niches and gaps. So small businesses have speed and agility and no cash, but they have speed and agility. They have hardworking people whose opinions count. They're not afraid to talk to the boss who might be their high school buddy. So small businesses have speed, agility, and although innovation is important, filling a niche and gap may not require radical new solutions. You may just be evolving something. Um, I don't know if this story is going to be boring because I don't know if you can relate to it, but when I was in the elect consumer electronics business, we made one minor modification to a product and um, ended up selling millions of dollars worth of that product at a very, 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 very high gross margin. Sears sold tons of it as well. So they made tons of money. So we went on for about three or four years. We were both making tons of money. We had a great time, had a great time at trade shows, entertained them, just great business. Later, that same company, uh, who I no longer worked for, SDI Technologies, they were the first to make a dock station for iPod. So they actually, through their own sort of on internal entrepreneurial program, they got rid of all their boombox business, all their rack stereo business, and they focused on iPods. They created the first iPod dock. They took a 
clock radio that they had the mold that they paid for. The mold is what they blow the plastic into when it's hot, and it makes the shape of the product as it comes off the factory. They took the CD player out of it, and they put an iPod dock in there. They got the license from Apple. They charged triple what they normally charged for it when it was a CD player, and they sold 1.8 million of those, and their profit on each one was over $30. And there were five partners in that business, and they split the profits at the end of the year. It's iHome Audio. So go to iohomeaudio.com. They're owned by SDI Technologies. It's a 50-year-old 50 50 year company. I worked there for about nine years. I love those guys. It's like the third generation now uh, of uh, owners. It's a family-owned business. It, they take the money home at the end of the year. Very successful. And what they did is they listened to their kids. So they'd been in the audio business. Their kids were coming up. They bought the iPod. They knew they had to change. And now those kids are working there today. They deal with Apple engineers. They fly from, they're in New Jersey. They fly from New Jersey to California once a month to work with Apple. That's, that's an exciting, exciting story. And that's a niche. And those people are very rich. They're not, pardon? They're not Steve Jobs rich, but they are rich. And that's finding a niche. Uh, a better business model sometimes is important. Amazon is a better business model. Started as a bookstore, right? So the average bookstore has 250,000 titles. Amazon didn't set out to, you know, have 275,000 titles. Amazon developed a better business model, over a million books to start. And by doing that, they've evolved. You know, they've, they've evolved with the business. They've driven the business. And now they're in the e-reader business. They're in the tablet business. But that was finding a niche. And when they first started, do you know how uh, Jeff Bezos delivered his books to UPS? Delivered on a bicycle with a basket. That's how he started. That's how small they were. I've sold Amazon now for many years. I know a lot of the key players. I've never met Jeff. But I know his team, the first people there. They're still there. They're in a cool VA hospital in Seattle that they bought. They retrofitted a VA hospital. The elevators are really long because they're made for the gurneys for a hospital. And it's an Art Deco, really cool old VA hospital. And it's their own grounds, their own gardens, their own you know, cafeteria. This started with a guy on a bicycle delivering the books to UPS to be delivered. All Great businesses start as a niche. Finding something that's underserved is almost the same as finding, and served poorly, is almost the same as coming up with a new technology. And as a, you know, a, a business technology, if you're a business technology major and you're into retail and you're into merchandising and marketing, I think those things should resonate with you because the world is evolving. We don't know what the next internet will be. When I was in college, there was no internet. There was no internet. I was here in 1976. There was no personal computer. There were mainframes. We punched our cards. We had, I had no idea what was going to happen. And so mature industries can be ripe for attack. I mean, think of bookstores. Think of clothing stores. Think of the shoe business with Zappos versus Nordstrom's. Just think of even medical information. Today, you go to your doctor. You don't have to just listen to everything he, he or she says because they seem very wise and they have that degree from Yale or Harvard or UT Medical School. You can go to WebMD. So there's always new thinking, new processes, better way to communicate. What is a brand? Nothing more than communicating. Better ways to communicate what your business is can give you an advantage. Better systems, more efficient. Um, I've sold Walmart um, when Sam was there. When they were a small outfit and there was no airport nearby, you had to fly into Fayetteville, drive for 45 minutes, everything closed at 6 o'clock, checked into your hotel, got up the next morning, drove over. Salesmen were in the lobby of Walmart's corporate office blowing on duck calls because the founder was a duck hunter, so they thought that would get them somewhere. 
But what they had an advantage on early on is because they started late in the game. They were a regional discount store that was behind Kmart. Kmart already existed, they were national. Sears already existed, they were national. Both of those companies and all the other companies had a very high cost of overhead. So by systems and efficiencies, Walmart kicked everybody's ass, completely. And they continue to kick everybody's ass. When you go to Walmart's corporate offices, there are areas where it's like Air Force control. You're not allowed back there. They have satellite dishes. They have so much technology going on. Their computer department sells technology and programs to NSA. That's how good they are. So while they may be good at low everyday low price, the reason they are good at everyday low price is they are extremely efficient. So that's their niche. And they continue to dominate. Um, so I think that those are areas where you don't have to be the technical genius. You don't have to be the super innovative designer. There are many, many ways to look at a business model and say, I can do better. We can do better. We can attack it. We can grow our business. I think find the thing that you're passionate about. If you're passionate about cars, do something in cars. If you're passionate about health, do something in health. Find a better way to deliver it. Find a better business model. There are, every, person I, every other person I run into is a personal trainer. How can you deliver a better industry than currently exists? Is there a way? I don't know. But there, there has to be a way in the future in many, many ways to deliver medical coverage, products, clothes, everything. So one of the things that I find in entrepreneurs is uh, a lot of them don't fit into corporate settings. Uh, or they, they haven't been in one long enough or they've been away from it a long time. And I think I'm starting to get there where I don't really fit in too many companies. So I'm kind of, I have to do these turnarounds and startups because I, I just don't fit into any other culture. It's too much fun to be in control of your schedule and too much fun to be in control of your life you know, it's just too much fun to make those decisions and to see your products created. Uh, Professor McKay and I both like factories. I like seeing factories create things. And I have a factory in Milwaukee, I have a factory in California, and I have a factory in uh, Guangzhou, China, and I have a factory in uh, Tianjin, China. And I love going to the factories and I love, I actually work in the factories when I go. I wear, I don't normally wear this stuff anyway. I usually wear sneakers and jeans even to the office. Um, but uh, I don't really fit. So, and I know what I love, and it's difficult for me to adapt to other cultures. I think that's one of the great things about being an entrepreneur is being free. That's the big plus side. If you like being in charge of your own schedule, if you like calling your shots, that's the fun side. The payment for all that, of course, is all the work. I've learned over the years, listen to my advisors, but not too strongly. My advisors over the years have always been older than me, and now I'm that old dude. Uh, and they have a certain way of doing things. And on the marketing side, and on the creative side, and the innovation side, they don't always have the best ideas. In fact, I have to say they, they don't. I don't think I would have the best innovative, creative ideas either. I just wouldn't. Uh, I'm 53, I don't think you, if you have a startup, I don't think you want me there for that. You might want me to write a check. You might want me to uh, uh, look at your financials, refer you to a good lawyer. Those things are great. I can do that. Listen, but not too strongly. Make your own way with your own ideas. So what do experienced entrepreneurs do? Well, it depends on their personality. A lot of them grow and sell. As you know, there's a whole Wall Street and venture capital culture that will pay you X times your EBITDA or your, your income, or they'll pay you X times revenues depending on the business. And there's a very, very strong motivation to sell something that you've created. So people do that, and a serial entrepreneur will do that. You, know, you create PayPal and go on and do something else. Create eBay and go on and do something else. And when you walk away with half a, million, half a billion dollars, you can do a lot of things. 
grow and kill. Well, in order to grow and sell, you have to be willing to bring on partners, hire employees, bring in financing. And when you bring in financing, you give up a piece of control. So if you start a business, you own it 100%. You give a little bit to employees, you give a little bit to partners. But when you bring in outside money, non-bank money, not debt money, but you know the famous VCs that you hear about, you give up control. And they will pay you what they think the value of your company is worth. You can negotiate, but not by a lot. But if you believe in it, and you have the ability to work in that environment, you can make a lot of money and grow and sell. So who grows and kills? Entrepreneur that grows and kills is the narcissistic person who doesn't really listen to anybody. And the only way that person can grow is through debt. And debt keeps building when you're growing, unless you've got a heck of a margin and you can self-fund. So that person is almost relieved when they kill their own business because they're so stressed out, they can't wait for the bank to take the business back. So that's the grow and, grow and kill. Um, don't be that person. Grow and sell or grow and grow. What is grow and grow? That's the rare person who can start in the garage like HP did and go all the way and grow into a huge company and go public and still stay with the business. Um, so grow and grow is a great strategy as well. Um, acquire other businesses, sell divisions, maybe sell your original division that's no longer valid. But those are the things that happen and can be very rewarding. So, oh, I, you know, I didn't uh, look at your textbook. I tried to kind of see sort of the, what the outline looked like on Amazon, but I wasn't gonna buy the $135 textbook <laughs> <laughs> for tonight. Um, so, I'm not sure if any of this is redundant, but as I learned from my friends at Walmart, redundancy is good. That's another part of their secret to the success. They have over a million employees, so they say everything over and over and over and over because no one's listening. <laughs> People don't listen. Um, and it goes in one ear and out the other. You know that from your psychology class. I mean, what is the statistic? 15 minutes later, you remember 50%, and then the next day you remember 10%, and then the next week you don't remember who I was. <laughs> <laughs> so um, beyond the traits, obviously identifying, selecting the opportunity, keeping the evaluation and, and business plan realistic and factual. Uh, I'm just about done with a book uh, called The Art of the Start by Guy Kawasaki. I highly recommend it. It's an easy read. He's, he was the head of the Macintosh project at Apple. He was sort of the, one of the inspirational designers at Apple. Uh, he was hired very young. He now runs a venture capital group called Garage Ventures. Uh, he's written a couple of books, I think maybe four or five. But he has a lot of things in there that are funny and very accurate about uh, business plans, mission statements, uh, how to pitch your business. And you know, he, he comes out of that VC world where you're pitching some very sophisticated investors. But you can take that and use it when you're talking to a banker, when you're talking to a relative, when you're talking to your spouse who has to live with you uh, on, on your dreams. Um, so that's a great book. But keeping the evaluation and business plan realistic. One of the things that I like that he says, and I've done both, believe me, I, I've made every mistake in the book. Um, when I was with the phone company, and this is typical of big companies, when we, when we started planning for the breakup of all the different bell companies, we wanted to look at the market for telephone equipment from single line phones all the way up to thousand line systems that you use at the University of Houston. So what does a big company do? They look at the total market and they say, okay, the total market is $50 billion. So we can get 10% of that marketplace or 1% of that marketplace in year one. And then year two, we can get 5%. So it's a top-down view. And it's a very easy way to talk yourself on your business plan into a very big number that you can say, this is very conservative. Because one of your numbers is conservative, 1% of the market, right? It's kind of like people who talk about doing business in China. If I can get 1% of the Chinese population to buy my health drink or my whatever, I'm gonna do $500 million in the first year. Um, that's a really horrible way, and most banks and most VCs 
will, they won't laugh you out of the room, but you're not going to get any further. Do a bottoms up forecast. In other words, I can afford to hire two salespeople. They can make nine phone calls a day. They can close a conservative number. That's going to give you your famous conservative number, not the tops down. Because the top down view is just, it drives you the wrong place in your business thinking and your planning. Um, so be realistic in your pricing, your share, your cost structure, your competition. Don't ever think there's no competition. If, you, if there's no competition in what you're looking at, then there's probably no market. <laughs> Have a clear strategy and be flexible enough to change it. And create a bit, from my viewpoint, you know, it's a lot easier with spreadsheets than with Word, but create a living document with easy to update financial projections and actual results. Under promise and over deliver. I'll bore you with another old timey story. When we did the breakup from AT&T and we created Pacific Telephone, which became Pacific Telesis, we modeled it on an Apple IIe. And I had three boxes of disks just for one spreadsheet. We did the actual business plan on Wang word processors. I created the cash flow uh, charts using Rubon letters and Rubon graphs. Those are not easy to update. So that document went to print and man, it stuck. Because there's no way we were going to, it took like 12 people a year to build that thing. So today, create something that's easy to update with actual results so you can re-budget and re-look at your business. A lot of businesses are seasonal. My business is very seasonal. I, when I first got into this business, I didn't know how, when the seasons were, so I've had to adjust that. I've now expanded out of my core fireplace business. I'm making window hardware for restoration hardware in Crate and Barrel because it's metal and we make metal and we can do that. So we begged and controlled and sold and pitched and pitched and we got that business. But I, I didn't know it, but window treatment's not that seasonal. So it's a great business for us. It's very regular, but it allows you to update allows you to be realistic. So that's kind of my discussion. I really, I haven't done this in a long time. This is something I usually am uh, talking to employees or board members or traveling to China or, I, don't, I haven't done this in a, in a very long time. I haven't pitched investors in a long time. So um, what time is it anyway? 6.30? So, but these are some of the places that I've worked. I helped start the cellular phone business because I was in the right place at the right time. Installed the first cell phone in LA. LA was the second cell phone market in the US ever open. Chicago was the first because Motorola was there. The cell phone was this big. The retail was $4,000. <laughs> so I was there at the right place at the right time. Uh, the company SOS Wireless, I was CEO of SOS Wireless. The inventor of the cell phone, Marty Cooper, who was the executive vice president of Motorola, he's the founder of that business and he brought me in. So I, it's just who you know. It's your network. It's that ecosystem you're creating. Um, ThinkLink. ThinkLink was a web portal business that had seven VCs behind it. I was in a board meeting once and one of the VC guys didn't know where he was. He had so many investments during the 90s, during the dot-com boom and bust that he didn't know which company he was in the board meeting. But ThinkLink, a board member on SOS, got me into ThinkLink where I was helping him with board matters and marketing and sales as a consultant. I was making 15,000 a month, working two days a week, consulting for this business. And I did that to a board member at SOS. While I was still drawing a salary at SOS as a board member here when we sold SOS. Again, it's who you know, what you do, how much money you make for them, and never ever step on anybody's toe. And never ever piss anybody off. Everybody's your friend. Guys, I know we like to kill the competition, we like to kill other guys, but amp it down. Everybody can turn out to be somebody you need. Razor Scooters, I hired a marketing firm at ThinkLink to launch a college program, to launch on colleges' campuses for ThinkLink. ThinkLink was before smartphones. 
It was voicemail that could be read to you over the phone. You know, it very, seemed very outdated today, but at the time it was hot stuff. Hot stuff, it was a web portal. Uh, the, their competitor got sold for $800 million. If our engineers had finished six months sooner, we would have been sold for $800 million. My 35,000 shares of stock, I might not be here tonight. But anyway, um, Razor Scooters, the guy who did the college program and I became friends, he's a great guy. He does subversive advertising. He's one of the first guys that did sort of, uh, take, he took uh, music level, band level promotion into corporate America. So he, he's one of the first people to do online advertising, sort of message rooms, chat rooms. And he, he does a lot of really cool stuff. Well, he introduced me to Razor Scooters because he's an, he's an X Games guy. He's a 48-year-old long-haired skateboarder from LA. <laughs> and he introduced me to Razor Scooters. And I had a blast there. It was so much fun launching a new toy or sporting goods product in LA with, with these guys. And I was a consultant there. And they're still successful. They're still around. They're still. Uh, uh, doing quite well. It certainly isn't as hot as it was. Now, they introduced me to the founders of Healy's. And I listened to my wife. And she said, those are never going to take off. <laughs> Don't even bother going to their booth. It was at a trade show. But I could have gotten involved in Healy's, but I didn't. Because I listened to my wife. I, <laughs> I, use, I use that a lot now. That's, that's my... Uh, that's my get out of jail free. Uh, Code Wireless was interesting. That was a bunch of hippies from MTV. Seriously, they were like programming guys from MTV. And they had this idea. This is before, believe it or not, this is before parents let their kids even have cell phones. So very few people under the age of 18 even had a cell phone because it was $1.40 a minute and it was $50 a month, yada, yada, yada. So they went after trying to make cell phones cool in a really MTV kind of way, and it didn't work. And it was kind of funny to consult for them and to be an advisor for them because they really didn't know how to run a business. They came from MTV, which was very successful. And so they were in a really big business. And they were producing videos, and they were, you know, they were, and they were cool. But they didn't, once they were out and they were on their own, they didn't know who to call. They didn't know what to do. So I came in and I was that guy that made calls and got them the cell phones they needed and, and hooked them up with people that were in the industry. And, but they'd sit on the internet all day and not do anything. They failed. They burned through $5 million of investor money. They failed. Razor was an internally funded startup by a lawyer and his wife. He took no outside money. Started on a picnic table, folding banquet table, in, an, in a uh, garage in El Cerrito. One container came in, they bought it, they sold it. Another container came in, they sold it, bought some more. Pretty soon they're bringing in 20 containers a month, 40 containers a month. Pretty soon we're in every store. I helped hire all their salespeople, do their marketing campaign, and work with uh, Scott, who introduced me there. So just wanted to share, you know, behind sort of the pitch that I was giving you on what, what DNA entrepreneurs should have and about having an internal uh, control mechanism. I'll just share you some of my own experiences. Uh, I've made money, I've lost money, uh, I'm still working, but I'm having uh, a, a great deal of fun. And uh, any, any questions or, you can text, if you're shy, you can text me too. <laughs> One of, the, one of the best ways to make a new team cohesive is have everybody work on a business plan. Give everybody a part so that way everybody knows what you, do, what you know and you don't know and also helps you know who you need. So when you get to sort of the engineering part and someone says, well, we need this, and you look around the room, oh, we, we don't have that. Uh, so building a business plan is actually a very good way to bring people together. And uh, you should do a business plan update every two months uh, after you get rolling, maybe every six months. You should update your financials every month. And you must, must track everything. In any business, but in particularly a startup, you need to track who's doing what and what their progress is. And it's, do it on a spreadsheet. Do your critical items. You know, there's an 80-20 rule. You know what that is, right? 
80% of your results are coming from 20% of your items. So agree to what those 20% are and focus on them. Even the CEO, founder, whoever, whatever hat they're wearing, they have deliverables. I do that today. I follow a program from a company called Map Consulting and they have a bunch of tools that I use. You can create the same thing. But the main thing is every month you're reviewing things that you're accountable for. It's too easy to get lost in what you're doing and you need that. Uh, I think Guy Kawasaki in his book calls it MAT, which I don't know, I can't remember what that stands for. But if you've got outside investors, you're gonna have to show them that. If you've got a banker, trust me, I got a banker now, he calls me, He's the nicest guy in the world, but I know why he's calling me. <laughs> he wants to know how, it's go, how, you know, how restoration hardware is selling. How's you know, this inventory item doing? You know? he's, uh, he finances my inventory and he finances my accounts receivables. So he wants to know. My success is his success. So track everything. And you know, you make, make, a, make a, a spreadsheet that has the responsible person, the strategic you know, thing that they're doing, that they're working on, and what the, what the status is, week by week by week by week. Hold people accountable. Secondly, when you hire people, if you're hiring friends and you're hiring people you don't know, it doesn't matter. Make sure you have a, a clear agreement on what their job is. It can change, but the worst thing you can do is get your friend involved and not have a clear understanding. Then you got all kinds of hard feelings. And don't give away the company too soon. Don't tell somebody again 1% or 5% before you even know what that means. Um, and as far as hiring people, I recommend reversing the process. Call the references first. Don't even interview them. Ask for four references. Then interview them. That's, that's the best way to do it. Um, anything else? Mm -hmm. um, how do you, what is the process when importing all the merchandise and bringing in? Do you have a, someone who specializes in your company? Or I do. I have one person, and he works with an um, outside um, customs broker. And those people are very reasonable. There's a lot of competition, so their, their rates haven't gone up much in two decades. It's kind of not a, not a great business model for them, but it's good for us. So they take care of all the paperwork, get it through, and you have a truck pick up the container, take it to your warehouse, then you unload it. But they make sure it's clear and they'll advise you if there's a problem. And then on the loading the, uh, loading the uh, container in China, you want to make sure you're working with um, people who know how to load the container. It's usually a big container ship company uh, that do hundreds of thousands of containers. The smaller and the higher value for the product, the easier it is to be in different businesses. One of the one of them is to import. If it's small and valuable, more fit in a container, so the logistics costs are less. The bigger the product becomes, the less cost effective it is to import from another country. That's why you have Hyundai plants here and Toyota plants. They're not really building cars, they're assembling cars because they're too expensive to ship, for the most part, from Asia. Uh, when I was with the Chinese company Hire, which I forgot to put on there, it was not a great experience, but. I worked for a state-owned enterprise. I worked for the Chinese government. I was senior vice president of sales and marketing for the Americas. Um, we were trying to import refrigerators. You can only put 80 refrigerators in a container. So um, we built a plant in South Carolina to build the refrigerators. So. But you need someone who has done that. So I hired this gentleman. He was with Sharper Image right when they went under. So he was easy to get. And he had been with, uh, what's the jacket? What's the has a logo on the front. Yeah. North Face. He was with North Face. He was there. He was there in Port. Sorry, I couldn't think of it. I, I don't wear North Face. I got sort of that anti-logo thing. Um, again, a lot of that stuff. You again, you collect people as you go through life, and and you find people who can advise. Surprisingly enough, your bank, your attorney, and people like that, they know people. They have other clients who do this kind of business, and they can be very helpful. So. Um, when I moved from Houston, I went to UCLA and I found out they didn't have a business program. They had just moved it to Cal State Northridge and I did not want to go to Cal State Northridge. I fell in love with UCLA. 
the campus, everything. So I ended up majoring in economics. So I did I, all the practical stuff I had here. <laughs> all the theoretical poli-sci and econ modeling I had there. Oh, they were so hoity-toity, they didn't take half my trans for credits from U of H. I ended up taking uh, uh, freshman English in my senior year at UCLA. <laughs> they transferred a half a credit of weightlifting, but they wouldn't transfer English and history and some other stuff. <laughs> so I think when you get that diploma, they want you to pay a certain amount. So I ended up going to summer school the entire time. Um, I ended up leaving Sears while I was there because basically their philosophy is different than U of H. They said, you, you must be a full-time student. You cannot work off campus. You must find a job on campus. So by that time, I was kind of an older looking dude because I'd worked myself into the ground. And I looked like a grad student. So I saw this job board and I went and I applied for a job. At the time, it was eight bucks an hour, which was unheard of back then. Um, and I got it. They thought I was an MBA student. And I ended up working for Carol Scott who is now dean of the UCLA, one of the deans of the UCLA Business School. And uh, what I did was I was a human Google. This is before the internet existed. I made eight bucks an hour to go to the library, find an article, Xerox it, bring it back to the professor. There were four, li there were four libraries on campus. It was before the PC, so I did a lot of data entry. So one of the guys that was her associate was trying to look, he was doing a paper on Stock price correlating to market share in light aircraft manufacturing. <coughs> the reason he did that is one of the few things that correlates well to market share and stock price is light aircraft manufacturing. I'm talking about Cessna and Beach. So I went to the bowels of the business library every day and pulled out like 1935 stock quote books. And every month I went through and I entered that data. I had a mainframe punching cards. I got up to go to the bathroom one day, and I lost two weeks worth of work. <laughs> they didn't save my program. But that's, like I said, that's before PCs. My first PC was a compact PC that was like this. Had a little green screen. <laughs> but, uh, I have an iPhone. I have, you know, I have all the latest technology because I came out of that world. Um, the, the, the phone company was very technology oriented. Yes? Uh, right now, how many businesses are you invested in? How many businesses am I invested in? Uh, right now, I'm invested in Pilgrim Home and Hearth, the business that I'm the CEO in. And I have a private equity group that are partners with me. And um, that private equity group is Tri uh, Triton Pacific Capital Partners. And they're in Los Angeles. And they're guys in their 30s that, have, that manage money for uh, very wealthy individuals. So one of the individuals they manage money for is the family that founded Reebok. They sold Reebok to Adidas for $850 million. We got some of that money into Triton, and I have some of that money in Pilgrim, among other. I have many other investors in the company. Um, when I read the, the flyer, it said that you were a member of DECA while you were part of the College of Technology. Can you share your experience while you were? I was actually DECA in high school. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I was working so much at Sears and trying to pay the bills. I didn't do anything much at, on campus. Yeah, I was the typical commuting, Commuter. living in the Moody, Moody Towers, going to class from 8 to noon, and then working from 1 to 9, and then studying from 10 to midnight. So I knew people who were in DECA, because I remember they're from high school. Well, yeah, it's all—it's about well, you know, about collecting people and knowing people and being, being part of the network. So I've run into people that that have been in Deca, that are now at Sam's Club, that are now at, at Walmart. Um, there used to be a small chain called Venture, which uh, went out of business. A lot of the a lot of the small discount chains went out of business when Target and Walmart grew, and a lot of the very good people at those chains ended up at Walmart. So the number three guy. At Walmart, there's a guy by the name of Gary Severson. You can Google him. Um, he's a guy that you know I kind of grew up with uh, in the business. Traveled to China with. He's a Mormon guy. He's got the six kids. Goes vacation to Utah. Um, 
but he's been instrumental in helping me in his own way, getting products, you know, giving me a break. The products have to sell, the products have to meet criteria, but you know, still you need to know people. You need to know who, who to call. So when the phone company broke up, there was a judge uh, by the name of Judge Green who was in charge of breaking up the Bell system. And he made all the decisions. He was the antitrust judge that was appointed. And he would do things and then change his mind or people would, then people would counter sue. So what they did is they decided how to break the yellow pages and directory up, which was a very big business at one time before computers. The equipment side, who would get the equipment side? Who would get the long distance business, which is extremely profitable? As you can imagine, you can call somewhere for a penny now, back when we charged five bucks a minute. <laughs> um, so all those got decided by Judge Green. And one of the things that happened was, originally AT&T was going to keep all the manufacturing, which was at the time a company called Western Electric. So they made all the phones. They made them in Louisiana, Chicago. Judge Green was sued by all the different Bell companies, including Pacific and Southwestern Bell at the time. And he changed his mind. He said, OK, you guys in the regions like Pactel and Southwest, you can market, but you cannot manufacture equipment. So um, basically, the outsourcing thing was sort of foisted on us legally. We were not allowed to manufacture. So, AT&T got all the factories, and we wanted to be in that business. And I ran into a friend of mine who was uh, doing some stuff with LG on the electronic side. At the time, they were known as Lucky Gold Star, and they had shitty quality. Target refused to do business with them. They were new in the business. They were just learning the business. Uh, in fact, that's why they rebranded to LG, because they were persona non grata in the US. They made VCRs that broke. They, they did, you know, it, it's typical when you're learning. But um, we went to them, and they started making our phones for us. And that's how I learned. I got on a plane and went to Korea. And then I got on a plane, I went to Hong Kong. And then in 19, gosh, the early 80s, uh, the Chinese government decided to open Shenzhen as a free economic zone. So that was the first one. You've probably read about it. It was uh, just a little fishing village. And uh, I went in there. There, were, there was already some factories. There was one hotel. Barber shops were outside. There was no border patrol. They were soldiers. Um, so it was interesting. So we just learned. We made a lot of mistakes. Uh, we've co I've been in businesses that have co-invested. I've been where we just outsourced. Um, so that's how I got started. Learn by doing. I do not speak Chinese. I cannot hear the tones. I have a Hong Kong office. I have five employees in Hong Kong. They do purchasing and translation. We have our, our major factories just across by train in Guangzhou. And uh, you know, they, they speak a, a, a decent enough dialogue, uh, dialect that they understand each other. Anybody here from Hong Kong or China? Hong Kong? China? Shanghai? No? Where? Okay. Been. <laughs> I've been there. I've been there. Anybody else? I'm from Hong Kong. Hong Kong? I'll be there December 2nd through the 12th. And I'll just go up into China from there. Great country, great people, natural entrepreneurs, natural traders, great sense of humor, fantastic to do business with. Yes? Uh, I have a question. How do you deal with local law, like business law? In China? Yeah. Um, all my factories are outsourced, so I don't own them. So I don't deal, I don't, I don't deal with local law except for trying to stay you know, abreast of the situation. So you're talking about like labor laws and all that? Yeah, yeah so um, we've. My dad worked for Citibank, and he was there for 10 years. I lived in China for eight years. Uh-huh. Um, he talked about um, business law and business law in China. Yeah. And how that affects the business law in China. 
Do I have their hands out or? Yeah. Yeah. That's not me, that's for you. Anyway. <laughs> China's, a, China's definitely a big country, and uh, I've had plants up near Beijing, and you know, there's different, different uh, cultures and different, uh, different dialects. I, I go to dinner sometimes, and the Chinese are yelling at the Chinese because one is, has the Iwu dialect, and one has the Shanghai dialect, and it's, it's quite interesting. But we vet our factories. We use um, third-party inspection services to make sure, you know, safety is being observed. We use uh, Restoration Hardware, which is a big customer of mine. They use uh, Bureau Veritas. Uh, it's a third-party inspection company. Safety is still a big issue there. They just they're very they're just very dangerous in everything they do. So, any other questions? Thank you very much. I hope I didn't bore everybody, but uh